Amen. Please remain standing for scripture. We're in Galatians 5, verses 13 to 15 today. If you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to use the one in the pew in front of you. It's on page 1119 of the pew Bible. Galatians 5, 13 to 15, on page 1119. God's word is inerrant and infallible. So let's look at it together. Galatians 5, starting in verse 13. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Uh, the word of the Lord endures forever. Please be seated. Have you all been having a, a, a good 4th of July weekend so far? Man, we, this is our first 4th of July here, so we've been enjoying it. The parade was great. We had food at, uh, at the 4-H club. There was sauerkraut with those, hot, those brats, so that was delicious. Uh, we went out to the inflatables, and we even saw the, uh, the fireworks. So it's been a, it's been a great, great uh, weekend. Uh, most of America will be out celebrating this weekend, celebrating the freedoms that we have in this country. Now, I say most and not all because there's a growing contingent of people who are protesting the uh, freedom we enjoy. They protest the uh, people who secured those freedoms, and, well, they protest the history of the nation. And let's be honest, whether or not we agree with whatever the protest is on either side of the issue, the great thing about America is that we have the freedom to speak and to uh, uh, share what we believe. But as we look at the American landscape, would you agree that some people abuse that freedom? That, that some of their activities and actions are just wrong? Because if we want to be a responsible American citizen, then we should positively contribute to our nation, right? Freedom carries with it some responsibility. And we should know and understand that as part of our duty as a citizen. Uh, abuse of freedom really is a perversion of freedom. And if that's true for America, then it's especially true for our walk with God. See, we have great freedom in Christ that was not possible before him or without him. See, before Christ came, people were subject to the law and to sin. Even today, if people don't believe in Christ, they too are under slavery to the law and to sin. See, the law demands perfection, but none of us are able to keep the law perfectly. See, we sin and, and fall short every single day. And so the punishment that the law prescribes because of sin is death and eternal separation from God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to take that punishment on himself. See, he committed no sin, but took our sin on himself and died on the cross. And three days later, he rose again. If you confess him, if you believe in him, then we will have forgiveness and, and eternal life. We also have freedom. Freedom from trying to keep the demands of the law because Christ fully satisfied the law for us. We are no longer under its slavery. We are no longer under the slavery to sin. But Christians can, well, they can abuse that freedom. They could go one way and rationalize that they uh, can use that freedom to do whatever they want. Or they could go the other direction and, and reshackle themselves to the law. Either way, the greatest freedom that we can ever enjoy in life is traded for something else, something, well, incomplete. So the question before us this morning is this, how do we use our freedom in Christ? But before we look into the passage, I just want to lay out the situation that Paul is writing this letter into. See, the Galatians, uh, Galatia was a province of Rome in modern-day Turkey. See, when the Romans conquered the Galatians, they made the Galatians use their gods, their currency, their, their laws, and, you know, everything else. Part of the Roman laws allowed benefits for certain groups of people. 
Now, this included the Jewish people. They, they allowed certain practices of the Jewish religion. So if someone practiced the Jewish religion, which, which placed great emphasis on circumcision, then they were allowed greater freedom. They were allowed to practice that. So it's easy to understand then how the Christians in Galatia saw the greater liberties that the Romans gave because of circumcision and thought that it might also give greater liberties in Christ. After all, circumcision was a biblical concept, one of the first covenants given to Abraham. That's one influence. The other influence into the Galatian church was a group called the Judaizers. Now, this group believed and advocated for all Christians to continue following the law, whether they were converted Jews or Gentiles. They argued that people had to be circumcised to be a true believer in Christ. If they were not circumcised, they said, then they were not a Christian. So, outside of the church, we have the government giving more freedom to people who were circumcised. And inside the church, we have a group of people saying that circumcision is essential to salvation. So, into this situation, Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians. Up to this point in this, uh, chapter 5 of Galatians, up to this point in the letter, Paul has addressed this two-part false teaching. See, he has explained the gospel. He has addressed and refuted the need and benefits of circumcision. And he even went all the way back to Abraham to teach how physical circumcision points to and is fulfilled in a spiritual circumcision that is given through Christ. And so he comes into this part of the letter. He is re-emphasizing the point that neither circumcision nor the law has any advantage for the believer. Christ has set us free, he says, so stand firm in that freedom. Let's look at this passage again with this context in mind. And let's answer the question, how do we use our freedom in Christ? Look at verse 13. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So he says that we are called to freedom. Freedom means that we are no longer slaves to the law. We are free from the curse of the law. We are free from the guilt establishing death of the law. This verse reminds us of verse 1 of this chapter. Just scan back up to the start of chapter 5. It says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. See, freedom is placed at the front of of the reasoning for Christ's salvific work. Why did Christ save us? For freedom. See, outside of Christ, the law has no claims upon believers any longer. Even though the Romans and the Judaizers brought confusion to the Galatian church, there is a clear calling to Christ, of Christ, to freedom. Believers have been brought out of captivity to sin, and the law, and into freedom. But then Paul follows this up with a limitation. Look at what he says. He says, only do not use, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Now this word opportunity is really interesting. The meaning of this word uh, gets lost on us in English. The Greek word means a staging area or base of operations for a military campaign. That's packed into that one word, opportunity. A staging area or a base of operations for a military campaign. Now, on D-Day in 1944, America launched an offensive against Germany along a 50-mile stretch of Normandy coastline. Their intent, which they were successful in, was to establish a beachhead from which to launch further offensive operations. From there, they were able to win the war. So Paul is using this word, opportunity, like we would understand the word beachhead. Okay, the Galatians and we need to take care not to let the territory that has been won for us by Christ to become a staging ground or a beachhead for counterattack by the hostile power of our flesh. See, when Paul uses the word flesh here, he is referencing our, our sinful human nature. The, the opportunities of the flesh are described in verses 19 to 21 of this chapter. Look at chapter 5, 19 to 21. This is what they say. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, the flesh wants freedom to express itself in any way that it wants to. Christ has not called us to that type of freedom. No, the freedom that he calls us to is freedom from those things. Our freedom in Christ should not be used for the flesh. That would pervert the freedom that he has given us. No, instead, Paul says, the end of, of verse 13, through love, serve one another. See, the word serve is from the Greek word meaning slave. Because of freedom, we are no longer forced slaves for fear's sake. We are willing slaves for one another for love's sake. See, this is a paradox, right? The Galatians are, are free from bondage and under grace. Believers are free from bondage and under grace. But Paul says that we are now free so that we may be willing slaves to each other. I mean, such service to each other is now voluntary, and the only compulsion is that of love. But he says for us to use our freedom to serve one another. Believers use their freedom to serve each other through love. It's our first point for today. Believers use their freedom to serve each other through love. Paul's response comes as a surprise, doesn't it? We may have expected him to say, you know, resist sinful desires, grow in Christ-like maturity, gain full assurance, or, or something like that. He doesn't even say become slave of, of God, or slaves of Jesus, or even of righteousness. No, instead he says to be a slave to each other, to serve one another as a slave. And the implications is clear. If, uh, if the way to keep the flesh from establishing a beachhead in our lives is through mutual love and service to one another, then the most likely way that the flesh will try to attack us is through things like pride and rivalry and, and individualism. It will try to tear away at our relationships and, and our community. So, Paul says, believers use their freedom to serve each other through love. Now, if you were to rate how well you are living this verse out right now, how would you, how would you rank? Good? Not so good? If it's not so good, why do you think that is? Maybe it's because serving one another, or to the extent that this verse says, being a slave to someone else, requires humility. It requires giving up our wants and desires and placing someone else's first. Serving someone else means that we're not being served. And if we're honest, we don't like that. Many times our freedom is about us, not someone else. So why would we use our freedom to serve? Well, look at verse 14. It says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now the word fulfilled in the Greek means reaching its climax or end. So the whole law reaches its climax in loving our neighbor as ourself. Paul continues to surprise us here, doesn't he? he, he to, to support his argument that we should use our freedom from the law to serve one another, he uses the law. I mean, up to this point in Galatians, the law has been shown to be a, an instrument of curse and confinement and slavery. But now, all of a sudden, Paul shows us that we can use our freedom in Christ, uh, in Christ-like ways, by focusing on the climax of the law. Because of Christ, the law has been transformed so that it now becomes a witness to the gospel. See, through his life and his death and his resurrection, Jesus reshaped the law and fulfilled it. The verse he quotes is from Leviticus 19, verse 18. And Jesus echoes this verse in Matthew 22, when he is talking about the greatest commandment. 
See, after stating that the first and greatest commandment is to love God with everything that we are, he follows up by saying in verse 39 of chapter 22 of Matthew, um, and the second is like it, we shall love your neighbor, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the climax of the law is on the principle of love, not the principle of self-vindication by works. This is a love that is born out of faith. And this love is directly tied to our neighbor. Neighbor meaning any and all who God puts in our way. Now Paul doesn't mention here the love for God that Jesus did in Matthew. That's because he has an eye on the situation. He's not answering what the greatest commandment is. He's focusing on the relationships of believers to one another. But we should understand that loving God and loving people are are inseparable. A love for God shows itself in a love for people. You know, I think we should put that on a a t-shirt as well, shouldn't we? You know, we're First Baptist Church. We love God and we love people. I'll think about that later. Jesus embodied this type of, of teaching throughout his life, his death, and his resurrection. He demonstrated what love for God and for our neighbors looks like. Paul teaches that believers are supposed to participate in this through their own service. See, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are a reflection of his love. We should show love for others just as Jesus showed love for us. And in doing so, we embody the meaning of love. Believers love their neighbor as themselves. It's our second point for today. Believers love their neighbor as themselves. We have freedom from the law in Christ, but we are to use that freedom to serve one another. And the reasoning that Paul gives for our service comes from the law that we have freedom from. But we see through his teaching that, you know, God has never changed. Even in the law, God gave us the teaching and the direction that he wanted us to follow. It wasn't like God was keeping it hidden from us and then revealed it later on. No, he he gave it to us right away. We just chose to ignore it. And that willful ignorance was because of our sin. But now that we have freedom from sin because of Christ, we can correctly use that freedom to fulfill the standard that we were once held to. Believers love their neighbor as themselves. But Paul doesn't put a qualifier on these verses. He doesn't say to serve one another only when the other person shows humility to you. He doesn't say to love your neighbor as yourself only when the other person is doing what you want them to do. That's because it's easy to love your neighbor and to serve your, your, your friends or other Christians that are humble and lovable. But what about those who are tough to love? You know, that's the trap that we often fall into, isn't it? We can use our, uh, other people's sin as an excuse to withhold service and love from them. When someone snaps at us, we often snap back. What happens then? What happens when we ignore service and love? What happens when we answer sin with sin? Well, look at verse 15. It says, But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Look at the harsh words that are used here. Bite, devour, consume. See, these words refer to animal-like behavior. It's like a vicious dog attack where believers are shown to be snapping at each other with open fangs. Each word escalates the conflict. Bite to devour, devour to conflict. Or to consume, sorry. The conflict ends with the destruction of one another. The basic idea is that nothing at all remains. See, if we go around taking chunks out of each other, then we will be consumed. Paul is most likely speaking about malicious talk and gossip here. This is the the opposite of loving our neighbor. This is the opposite of serving one another. This is the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. Believers are no longer a group of isolated individuals. We are brought out of bondage to live in community. And this community should be one of kindness, of gentleness, and of goodness. It should be one where we lovingly serve each other. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians follow the the worldly way of individualism and consumerism 
more than the way of Christ. But we are called not to go out on our own, but to live and support one another in community. We cannot grow when we are not in community. We need each other. There's no such thing as a Christian ninja, right, who slides into services and slides out of services with no one seeing us. If you're like that, if, if, you're, um, if for one reason or another you, you rationalize not talking with people, not building relationships, maybe are even harsh with fellow believers, or even if you think uh, oh, that you, or even if you talk to certain people and not um, to others, only to certain people that you know. Here's a specific application point for you. Stay after the service for just a few minutes and invest in someone else, someone outside of who you normally talk to. You don't have to jump into the deep end right away. You don't have to stay 30 minutes or 20 minutes or even 10 minutes. Not right away. Just start with five. Start with one person. Do that for a few weeks and then increase it a little bit. See, God saved you so that you could love and serve others. We are free from using people to our own ends, and we are free from seeking approval from other people. So use your freedom to encourage and to pour into someone else. Hindering each other ultimately harms ourselves. And an incorrect use of freedom will ultimately destroy us. A critical nature is destructive. It's our third point for today. Right out of verse 15. A critical nature is destructive. See, a critical nature, that's the, that's the result of our own, insisting upon our own rights in Christ. Biting, devouring, consuming one another happens when we read this passage in the opposite way of what it's written. Almost as if we read it like this. Use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh and through selfishness make others serve you. Love yourself as yourself. That sounds a lot like the world today, doesn't it? That's the doctrine of our sinful nature. And when pride is what we put into practice... When ourselves are more important than anyone else, we will bite, we will devour, we will consume one another. And we'll respond to these actions in kind. You know, anger begets anger. A negative attitude begets a negative attitude. Dealing with these things can be a burden. A critical nature is destructive. But that is not the freedom that we have in Christ. No, our freedom is one so that we can follow Christ's example. An example of not insisting on our own rights. An example of, of placing God and others before us. An example of using our freedom responsibly. How do we use our freedom in Christ? To love, serve, and build each other up. Free believers love, serve, and build each other up. It's our big idea for today. Free believers love, serve, and and build each other up. We help each other. We encourage one another. We humble ourselves and we lift others up. We outdo one another in showing love. That is how we use our freedom in Christ. Even when others aren't using their freedom properly, we still should. Not only for ourselves, but to teach them and to bring glory to God. Free believers love, serve, and build each other up. To apply this passage to your life this week, first, find ways to serve someone else today. Try to think of practical things that you can do. If someone is sick, offer to bring over a cup of soup. Parents with young kids, I'm sure, could use a date night. I expected an amen there, but that's all right. It's in your, you're too tired. It's okay. <laughs> Nursing home members, homebound members would love a visit from you. You could write a, an encouraging note and, and so on. Serve one another today. Secondly, if there was any selfish attitude that we may have, just repent of it and commit to loving your neighbor. Selfishness is something that we all deal with. It's, it's common to almost every single human in the world. So I don't know if you are selfish or to what degree. But if you're feeling convicted about it, I think that's probably the Holy Spirit uh, prompting you. Selfishness is a shackle. A burden that takes away from your freedom. So let go of it and then just intentionally commit yourself to loving your neighbor. And finally, 
reconcile when and where needed. See, do this especially in light of the ways that, that you may have bit and devoured and consumed someone else, or that someone else may have done that to you. Forgive the sin and engage in the hard work of reconciliation. Christ has set us free. So let's use that freedom to love, to serve, and to build each other up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this, this morning and we just thank you that you have set us free. Thank you, Lord, for setting us free. Setting us free from the sin that overwhelms us. Setting us free from the law. Thank you for fulfilling the law. And I pray, Lord, that you would just open our eyes and our hearts to understand how we can use that freedom practically in our lives. Help us, Lord, to use it to serve one another, to encourage each other, to build one another up. Lord, help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for your word, that we can learn from it. And I pray, Lord, that we would put it into practice this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen.